Hi, Susan. Can't hear you. That better? Yes, now. Awesome. Hi. Hi, Good honey. Morning. Oh. How are you doing? Oh. Yes, good to oh. see you. It's awesome to see you. It's really yeah. awesome to see you here. How are you? I'm doing fine, you know. I'm in the middle of a healing process that I have been, uh, you know, carrying on for a while, but now it's the moment <laughs> I can see. It. Boy, isn't it true, no matter what we've been either keeping under or might not have been revealed yet, that there's no option. We all have got to face up and heal. I am amazed. For me, it's, I see the connection between what is going inside and what is going outside. And what I think is happening is kind of a reflection of the collective crisis in which we were living. Amen. This is the truth. This is the truth. We, we literally so have been, we've been living very unawake and very unaware and and this is a collective wake up call like whatever was before is done it's done i'm i'm very happy to see your face and to hear your voice and to hear your ideas because i know you are one of these special persons here in miami and i'm very happy that you accept my invitation to you know this podcast because it's great to talk to you I just would like to introduce you briefly for those people who don't know you. And I would say that you are a social entrepreneur, a spiritual entrepreneur, a mindful entrepreneur that is helping a lot of people to, you know, get a better path in their life, right? To look at the things that are important in their life, to heal, to, to make a better experience living. And I appreciate every time that I go to your um, events, the level of tolerance and acceptance and, you know, diversity. I love it. I would like, please, if you can introduce yourself a little bit. Awesome. Thank you. First of all, um, it's an honor to be here with you and Thank speak you. properly. Doctora, I want to <laughs> say uh, Eva Silvo Bravo that we, we properly name the wisdom that you have for bringing together your gifts and offering me a chance to be one of the few people that you, you know, the, the many people you talk to. So my name is Suzy Ann Jewell. Um, and I am also known as the mindful entrepreneur. And apparently the little other phrase that's coming through is the mindful jewel. I never as a branding person <laughs> thought to use my own name and here you go. It's like right at the ready that I can actually use it. Um, my background is actually in the global branding strategy and marketing business. For years, I did that in the television industry. And then after that, for quite a few years as my own um, consulting agency owner. And interestingly enough, when I started to go through some of my own personal uh, challenges that are not unique to me at all, they're common to everyone, which is I had a mother who started to pass away of cancer. Um, I ended up having some health crises. It all came crashing down for me in two specific health calls. One of them was um, panic attacks that ended me up in the ER. And I had a doctor who basically said, there's nothing wrong with you. You just need to learn how to regulate your nervous system. And the other was a three-day migraine that turned out to be an unruptured aneurysm of two millimeters in the back of my brain. And it was too small, as they call it, to operate on. Um, they said until it gets eight millimeters, which is a really curious thing, like don't operate until it grows. So uh -huh. I've lived with this thing in me and my aneurysm has become my teacher to literally wow. learn how to pay attention and, and, and to be on purpose. So my work now and the clients I work with has shifted dramatically. I do a lot of work now in the startup space with other solopreneurs, other social impact entrepreneurs. Um, some projects I did three years ago help launch the first ever World Happiness Summit. Um, I've done some work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And for any of you who don't know anything about them and all you've paid attention to are conspiracy theories, they are not what the conspiracy says. Um, I've worked directly with Melinda. Um, they are two bold, brave entrepreneurs who have given away half of their wealth to actually try to make public health on earth. I, I believe the same, you know, they are just trying to do the best that they can with what they have. 
and what they know. And, and amazingly, you know, um, in that process, when you're brave and bold and stand forward, as you know, because you and I, Ava, came together through one of my organizations called Venture Women, um, which is all about being bold, brave, badass business babes, um, is that those of us who are going to actually change anything are not going to be able to stay vanilla. The days of being white toast or being cardboard colored are not only over, um, and I understand that, that all of us are hurting, um, and yet the times are calling for us to find out what matters and, and how do you find what matters. But let me, let me ask you something. I see there's a difference between people who have been doing individual jobs or you know, healing jobs. They have been working with themselves, and they have a level of awareness that allows them to see the world in a totally different place, that allows them to understand things that probably they don't have an experience, but they, at least people listen. And those people who don't listen, people who think that whatever you're telling them, you're criticizing them, you're point, making, pointing fingers at them. And I don't see a lot of listening skills, you know, in our communities, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. How do you work with that? What do you do like to make people more tolerant or to you, you know or, or empathetic? The the angle I'm gonna always turn to because this has now become become my way of living is the mindfulness path. And I'm gonna context it with a short little story, which is to say to you, um, years a few years ago I considered interfaith ministry because I am called and whatever you want to call the divine, it kind of doesn't matter to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been trying for a few years to knock on the door of what does that call look like and, and what does it mean? And I don't come to what I do from the yoga mat. I come to it from this corporate executive, very left brain, logical, rational, very type A, clearly white, cisgender, bisexual ally. So, you know, there are all my boxes. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the things that's happened to me recently was that not only have I committed to this mindfulness path, I'm in a two year training program at Berkeley to get a, a training certification that will wrap up in January of next year. Um, I had been during the COVID crisis homeless, I say between air quotes, at a roof over my head, but my place back in February got toxic mold. So I literally lived in friends' homes because no one was renting, people weren't showing property, yeah all of these things. So I've had this really interesting journey of being like a Jew in the desert or being like Jesus during the 40 days and mine like left. a nomad. Like, like a nomad. nomad. I've been a freaking wandering vagabond. And here's what's more interesting than that about the reason I'm about to share my, my point to the answer of the question you asked. I finally found a place. It is a lovely little um, standalone cottage. So it's like its own home in the back of a half acre of a historic home. That makes cool. me very happy. I live under yes. two low trees. Yes. And three weeks ago and three days ago on that day, we had that crazy ass storm. I'm sorry, two weeks, that storm of 15 inches of everything coming down. 15 inches of water came toward my cottage and four inches of it came into the walls of my new home. Mm. I ended up most interestingly on the doorstep of the Aware, Open Awareness Buddhist Center in Miami in El Portal. Wow. So when I've done my work, which is sitting in quiet and saying, show me the way, offering myself up to be used, realizing I've got the gift of presence, that's a gift. Mm -hmm. I've got a bit of Pied Piper because people, when I speak, will listen and show up like you do and many others who support. I realize that's privilege. No matter what color skin, skin I'm in, that role is privilege, and therefore there's a responsibility I have to deeply listen. What's mine to do? What is mine to do? And then, and then much later, what is mine to say? First, what, is, what, what do you want to do with me? So I was pretty struck, Ava, that I ended up like Jonah in the Bible, washed up with my lily white ass on the doorstep of a Buddhist center. Like, who does that happen to? Happened to me. What did that mean? I realized it meant in the midst of all of this, not only deeper listening, but I'm the daughter of a man who was mayor at the beginning of the 70s in a small town in Michigan that you probably don't know about. 
And my dad stood in the middle of the race riots in Grand Rapids. And when I was five years old and I was about to go out to our suburban to go to church on one Sunday, my dad grabbed me by the, uh, the waist, threw me into the house. I smashed into a piece of furniture, got glass in my foot because someone drove by our house and blew out the, sh the front windshield of our car with a shotgun wow. because my dad didn't take money from certain uh, parties. I'll leave those names off this talk. And my father was a big friend of the African-American community. He built the first community center in the downtown area of Grand Rapids. There you so go. I grew up with a really different lens. I will not at all try to say that the sack of skin and the bag of bones I walk around in are not white. You, you don't have to feel guilty for being I don't. white. It's not about that, you know that, right? But what I don't know in the glasses I've not worn and the body I've not walked in to be unsafe on the streets of this country, to not be able to go take a walk in the park, to not be able to sleep in my own home like Breonna Taylor and be, unaf be afraid that someone may or may not come into my place and kill me. I can't stand in a country that literally speaks about justice for all when that is what's happening. And so when you ask the question about listening, We've got to be brave, white and black and brown alike, about what is a Buddhist precept, which is learning to turn toward what is actually here. Not what we think we see. Yeah. Not what our conditioning tells us we want to see, that I don't see skin color. Bullshit. 401 years, and I don't care what color you're walking in, you see skin color. No, not and only you see, you act based on that. Act from the skin color. Arrangement, you, that you black have, people are not part of the arrangement. You know, unaware conditioning and bias that's built in about, for example, in one of the journeys of me staying somewhere, a beautiful friend offered me refuge in a home that was a neighborhood that was primarily black and I was the minority in the neighborhood. Do you know I was safer as a white woman in that? neighborhood than most African Americans were in that neighborhood because of the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. So if we can't tell the truth first, that's yeah. where we've got a problem. Yeah. And if we can't also learn to do the precepts of mindfulness, which is pay attention on purpose in the moment, and here's the two that I think are going to be the really interesting kickers for us, non-judgmentally and with curiosity. If I can look at that and go, wow, Wow, look at that. Well, That's I think it's so difficult is that people, we are so used to certain narratives of identity yep. that we are so attached to them that we don't know how to let go of them. If the reality is telling you that something is not working, instead of looking at what is not working, people just react. And what really, what is sad for me is the divisions that are taking place right now as we speak, you know? The reconfiguration, which is normal, but in a way, um, it, you know, I don't know if that happened to you, but in my case, I've seen some friends that I realized they're racist. They, uh, they don't know how to deal with this situation. They don't know what to do. They don't know. And I, I have been from trying to explain to like not acting, not, you know, because I think it's our all, all responsibility individually to learn what we don't know. Dr. Eva, I not only have seen friends, honey, I've seen family. Family too. And, yeah. and in my case, even with the context that I came away with a family of five and I'm the youngest one and I saw my dad in this role um, and I came away from that differently, mm -hmm. um, I see this too. And, and then, and probably because I'm wired this way, and maybe because one of the beautiful traditions does tell us faith, hope, and love, and of these three things, the most important is love. And what am I, what am I doing? I'm going back and pulling out my MLK books. I'm going back and I'm rereading the autobiography of Experiments in Truth by Mahatma Gandhi. I'm rereading all these beautiful little books by Thich Nhat Hanh that are these little tiny pocket books called How to Fight and How to Love. And it was Thich Nhat Hanh as a Vietnamese um, 
activist and rebel who no longer could return to Vietnam because not only had he spoken up about the injustice there against the Vietnamese people, he sat with Martin Luther King and it was his conversation when Martin Luther King opened his heart and his heart heard with ears that could hear, have eyes that can see, have ears that can hear, and heard what it is that Thich Nhat Hanh shared about the Vietnam War. And Martin Luther King came out in protest of brotherhood because of what he heard. Because he let his heart be changed and he had a change of mind. And what you're discussing, and this is basic psychology 101, and if we're going to admit that we're in a time of human evolution, you know, here's the gift, people. You've woken up as the new human is being birthed. And oh, fuck, birth hurts. Here comes the birth canal. It's going to squeeze you on this side. It's going to push you out on that side. The little womb you lived in before where there was water and nutrients and it was all warm and it was fuzzy and it was comfortable and you could turn to this side and suck on your thumb and you could turn to this side and suck on your thumb. It's done because when birth is called to in Spanish, dar a la luz, you don't give birth in English, you bring to the light in Spanish, you give to the light. Yeah. We collectively right now have been told that the womb is closed for business. It's done. Whatever that place of, of, of nourishment, however wrong and inappropriate and racist and unjust it was, is over and the squeeze has now begun. So everything we knew where we ate and we breathed and we rested before is over. We're being squeezed through to whatever is next. And we don't know how to breathe. Not only did George use those words as his last three words, here's the really interesting thing and why mindfulness does matter right now. Ava, my work, I believe, I could be wrong and I could get sliced and diced by all my black and my white and my brown sisters and brothers, but I'm gonna bravely stand forth. I think the first place to start is the place where George had to depart, which is the three words. I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. I think the place to start is whether it's first and only in BIPOC, you know, uh, uh, black, indigenous, and people of color communities. Maybe this has to start only without people who look like me in the room and I could understand it, which is to learn how to breathe. Because none of us can breathe right now. None of us. We it's, don't know how to be with ourselves. We don't know how to be with ourselves. We're all feeling it way up here, here. Some of us can't sleep. Our chests feel like they're compressed. We're experiencing grief. Why, as human beings, in your experience, in your coaching experience, why is it so difficult to become tolerant or to, you know, with our own system, or our own breathing, or our own way of thinking? You know what I mean? Like, why is it so difficult for human beings to recognize that we are so stressed out, that we are far away from where we are supposed to be when it comes to our rhythm, our natural, the natural flow? It's a gorgeous question, Ava, and there's a piece of literature from um, James Joyce, the famous Irish literature, and I know you're a big literature, so you remember this, and it's a piece of tiny teaching that says Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his body. So that's a piece of literature that tells us that story. Then move to modern day neuroscience with Harvard's Lazar Lab. And they came to find out that of the 24 hours we have to be alive, knock off maybe eight hours, maybe you don't sleep eight hours, maybe you do, but for the sake of the argument, let's say you do, and let's say there's 16 hours that you've got to literally be vertical instead of horizontal, okay? 47% of that time, our mind and our body are not in the same place. Mm. So we're either touching these things 250 times a day, so we've never been mm. here before in humanity. We're touching these things more than we touch that which we love, whether it's a body, a being, a, a pet, you know, our favorite orchid. We're touching things that have no life in them, that don't breathe, that have no heart yeah. rate or ability, more than we touch living entities. And then in addition to that, part of what's happening is we're living in yesterday's argument, which is the past, and that creates depression. Or we're already chewing on something that is not yet here, and it's not in the present moment, and it's the future, and that can create rumination and anxiety. 
So yeah. all of a sudden, and we're wired, by the way, to run toward pleasure. And we're wired, by the way, to run away from pain. That's a, that's a survival mechanism that has helped us from the time when saber-toothed tigers chased us and when every one of us was a descendant of Lucy in the Rift Valley in Ethiopia that I've had the blessing to go and actually gaze my eyes upon when I worked for the Gates Foundation was to see that place. Where did the beings that we are now walking on two feet come from? And part of our nervous systems were wired that if something growled in the woods to run like hell, if we actually went someplace and we found berries off of a tree and those brought us pleasure, that particular physical thing, by the way, would be called a one-off. The saber-toothed tiger experience is called a one-off and it's called a stick. And the other one is actually called a chair, I'm sorry, a stick. The other one is called carrots. So a stick experience is it comes along once and if you fuck up and make the wrong decision, you're done. So if it's a tribesman coming after you, it's someone who slammed your head up against a rock, if it's a warrior in, if it's a saber-toothed tiger that you don't survive against, it's a one and done. That's called a stick. Carrots are things that if you go to find a mate and you don't actually consummate, you can go find another mate. If you don't find the bush that's got food on it, you can find another bush. If you don't actually kill that creature that you're gonna eat, you can find another creature. Our nervous system got wired on these carrots and on these sticks and carrots. Mm. So what sticks to us most is the stick that's a one-off. So we're based and wired on fear. And yet we draw ourselves toward anything that makes us feel pleasant and pleasurable. So we're not systemically wired to sit with our own shit. Mm. We're wired to run away from it. So yeah. that is one of the reasons even doing a practice of breath whether it's in a community of color, whether it's in a bi or multiracial community, whether it's by yourself at home, no one's given us a manual that says, hey, human being 101, guess what happens? When you stress out, you won't be able to breathe right. No one teaches you that this is your adrenal gland, which is if you take that same hand and put it at the back top of your waist, it's where your kidneys are in the back and your thumb would be. This is your spine. This is the amygdala that blows into the back of the brain, which is called the reptilian part of the brain. It's the mm -hmm. part of the brain that kids call the barking dog. If you learn mindfulness as a child, <laughs> it's the, oh shit. It's here comes a cop. If you are walking around in brown or black skin. And then over this is the prefrontal cortex, which is this part of the brain, the more evolved mammalian part of the brain. And if you are in fear and you've got adrenaline blowing up the back of your spine and it's going into your intestines, your stomach, your thorax, your heart, your throat, and then also obviously into your brain, which includes your eyes and your jaw and your mouth and everything else. If that cop has stopped you and you're black in the car driving while black, you might flip your lid because you will have such a high increase of heart rate and that heart rate right here will not only feed into the adrenaline, the adrenaline will feed back into the entire feedback loop. And it's because no one's taught us how to keep ourselves online. Part of just breathing through the nose, for example, for a count of six, holding for one and pushing out like a straw. So hold and then, but for eight seconds, two seconds longer than you breathe in, will begin anything that's gone offline, which is your rational, executive, logical thought process, which by the way, the cop who stopped you is having the yeah. same response because a cop yeah. is also going into a state of hypervigilance. Maybe yeah. they know how to breathe better or don't, but the only way to meet each other rationally and logically is to come back online and not be responding from that place that's where the saber-toothed tiger lived that's fight, flight, or freeze. Because then all we're doing is responding from the baser, and by the way, very justified right now, I'm not removing that, but anger and rage and pissed offedness and F you and all of that, which is absolutely necessary and justified. When we stay there too long though, not only do we no longer have the ability to think rationally and logically, we also are not then making decisions that are collectively including our heart space. 
And we're wired, no matter what color skin we walk in, we're wired to feel empathy for other people. We're technically wired that if we see someone harmed, which by the way, is one of the reasons that this time, when a black man was killed, I've read something by Robert Smith, who many know is one of the biggest and boldest black philanthropists and venture capital and investors. And he said something so mindfully aware, I've shared it on LinkedIn. He said, had it not been for the quiet of COVID and even the time between when Ahmad got shot and when George said his words in the eight minutes and 46 seconds went by, had it not been, interestingly, he shaped this, for the quiet of COVID, we wouldn't have heard that. Of course. Had we all been watching sports and paying yeah. attention to the noise that's the noise of these things. Yeah, going so, things as usual, as usual. Business as usual. So I'm struck that there are, while I agree with you, there's a lot of voices of intolerance. I spent, for example, last night on a Zoom call with Van Jones, who's one of my heroes, just like Robert Smith is. Like, I'm finding, and you know me well enough, when I'm, I'm going in, I'm going in, and I'm going to figure out, okay, who's got a voice here Absolutely. that I can find some sort of upliftment with, and yes, look at my own shit. I need to do that. Look yeah. at whatever my work is to do. But Van Jones, on a talk last night with Tara Brock and Jack Kornfeld, who are both my teachers, organized an entire event around how to win Wisconsin. So it's Buddhists who are mindfulness practitioners with the wisdom that Van Jones has around how you actually understand national elections and what that can do to at the top, from the bottom and the middle, start to change the world we live in with two of the most savvy election organizers um, on the call as well and Van said something I just quoted that I need to give the credit back to Van. He said, with tears in his eyes, a black man got killed and this time people actually cared. And he said it two or three times because he said, I almost can't believe it. He said, if they had invited him to do the talk the week before, he said, I couldn't have gotten on this call. Even though he loves Jack and Tara, they're both white. He said, I was too on fire. So he was too in an activated state. He said, I've practiced enough to recognize I was able to come back down and realize that my gift, he said, as a man, a black man, a smart and educated and someone who's got a position of power black man, can actually be a bridge amongst all of this so that we can do what really does need to be done, which is get past disenfranchisement of black voters in every single state in this country. And Ava, between him and Robert Smith and me being able to have the invitation of the privilege of speaking to you today, I've got hope. Today I've got hope. I'm a person of hope always, but let me ask you something else that I think is important. That has to do with the how the society function, how we are used to function in the society, the rules of the game. And I think some rules of the game, we need to do something about them. Especially when it comes to, we are based in competence, right? We compete with each other. Yeah. But can we do friendly competition? Do we, do, does it have to be so nasty as it is? I think that's part of what it's creating because I see as a non-white person, I see that I have seen myself as a threat to so many white women in America that I don't understand because I have knowledge, because I am, um, I can, you know, talk, I can think, I can, and I'm like, what is that, you know, what's that? I, I, I never understand that, never, ever. And it's not only white women, you know, right. I'm talking, it's not only, and I, and even within the black community, there's a problem because there's a lot of competence and there's a lot of, there's a lot of division, you know? And people sometimes are looking at you, where are you coming from? Instead of like, what is she talking about? Let me see how we can relate to each other. Right. How we can work together, how we can collaborate. The, 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 the task of collaboration 
it's a difficult project. It, you know, you, you know I've been walking, because you've come to them, you know I've been walking this path about this topic as regards women, because we've talked about this, that, that women have this instantaneous, and again, unconscious, not relating it at all to the topic of racial injustice, because I don't want anyone to think I'm co-opting that conversation for having the discussion, but it's the frame you and I have met through. Yes. Um, and it's this topic that when women meet other powerful women, um, in two seconds or less, it's head to toe, toe to head. And in that amount of time, it's, who is she? She's smart. I want her jewelry, but man, I don't like her tone of voice. She's a bitch. And in that amount of time, there is an immediate, um, assessment and, one, if we don't know that we do that, there's step one. Okay, what's arising in me? You know, the, and the beauty of the mindfulness practice in this regard is, let me sit, let me have awareness. You know, it is believed that there are five basic energies or emotions that we have that are just being studied. This part of us being human and evolving at the same time is fascinating. The Dalai Lama just hired Dr. Paul Ekman and his daughter to create the first ever cartography map of the Atlas of Emotions. So beyond whether or not Christopher Columbus got the wrong uh, attribution for being the first person who came here and all of the doctrine of, of discovery that he brought with him of the bullshit that came from the Catholic Church that was sanctioned. Now we're still suffering. A sanctioned conquistador mentality, like push that all aside. We've never written a map about this nature of being human. Off those five basic emotions that we have, we have 500 ways of expressing them. So our ability to self-regulate, like, let me meet this woman. Oh, wow. I've paid attention to her online. Now I'm meeting her in person. I'm called or drawn to her for some reason, but I don't like her shoes. Or I want her shoes, you know, whatever it is. I know, it's a weird We thing. have these these triggers in us, and then we draw conclusions. The whole opportunity of where we're sitting right now in that regard, Ava, also around the topic that you just said of competition. And I never knew I'd be talking about this against the lens of what I'm learning, by the way. Here's another teacher I wanna shout out here who is a badass um, African-American leader of the Lotus Institute. His name is Dr. Larry Ward. He is a former um, Episcopalian priest turned Zen Buddhist who got his uh, training and also a theologian. I think he might have gotten his degree from Harvard Divinity. Um, but anyway, uh, got his, his Zen Buddhist practice with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. So, and, and he's an elder. So he's someone who's been on this planet. He knew Martin Luther King. So he's speaking from age and wisdom and walking this. Mm -hmm. um, He's who is teaching me around the topic of the lens around the doctrine of discovery and the sanctioned ability to go in and steal and not serve and stop and kill anyone who didn't fit what the Catholic outlay of the doctrine of discovery was all about. So looking back in Spain, this meant Muslim, that was the primary first focus was Muslim. Yeah. Underneath that meant Arabic. Underneath and in that was Jewish. And very quickly, because Spain, where I lived for two and a half years, is this for 800 years mixing pot that was Arabic and Catholic and yeah. Jewish. And it was a gorgeous community of, of wisdom and creativity and literature and art and, and architecture. They figured it out for 800 years. It's not the bullshit people talk about as regards the caliphate in the way that the modern day people are talking about it. It was actually a very different world than what's being trained into people's minds around that. Hmm. But what that doctrine of discovery gave people the opportunity to do was go take from others what did not belong to them because of what they looked like. So when you talk about competition and we even unearth the true issues around privilege, it came from across the ocean. It's been, it was institutionalized by the Catholic Church. It's become very known to many Latinos, especially the way the missionaries and other things that were built on the West Coast of the United States. 
Mm. But in our here and now, it comes down to this basic idea that we all don't think there's enough. Somehow we don't think there's enough of a stage for you and I to both sit up here. Somehow we think that if she looks better than me, there's not enough room for both of us to have the same amount of social media followers. I know. Well, Somehow we're... we've drawn this conclusion that, um, you know, because uh, someone's shining brightly, there's not enough light for me to shine brightly too. And, and, and it, I know. Is it, it's, it's, it's in our minds. It's so and weird. It, and it is a part of the wiring around competition. I'm going to go someplace else that is going to be even more uncomfortable because I'm clearly not meant to keep my mouth shut anymore. It also has a lot to do with testosterone and dominance, which is a very masculine, um, conquering, uh, which is not, and many men have a lot of feminine energy in them and a lot of women, I'm one of them, have a lot of masculine energy in, the, in them. I've got that very strong alpha female in me. Yeah. I've been the head of the pack. Yeah. But in that process, there's also a, this is for me and there's no room, you're, there's no room for you at the table. And yet we've got women, and this is, you've seen me probably posting this stuff. I'm going back to who were my sheroes, Shirley Chisholm, newsflash friends, for those of you who don't know, 1972, first African-American and first woman to run for the Democratic nomination for president of the United States. Actually got 152 of the votes, which was 10% of what was available in the Electoral College, was completely dismissed from being able to be on the televised primaries until she went to legal battle, got on one primary, and then ended up serving six sessions and terms in Congress. So here's what I do think is so interesting. We can spend a lot of time wondering why it isn't that way. We can spend more time asking what's true about what parts of us need to be uprooted or weeded because we're all a garden. What mm -hmm. lives in my garden that's an old dead plant? Or what weed am I still watering? And maybe it's not enoughness. Maybe it's that I still don't understand, which a lot of white people don't understand, that the word privilege they think has to do with being born with a spoon in their mouth, a silver spoon in their mouth, they don't understand that it has to do with a system that's been built for almost 500 years, going on 500 years now, that beyond whether you grew up poor in a trailer park and maybe might have been white, is nothing to do with the fact that the system will still give you privilege because of the color it's of your skin. As simple as, if you're a white woman, you can say, this is correct, if you want to confirm something. Yep. If I am a, a, a non-white person, woman, I cannot say that. Nobody's going to believe me. See? It, it, it's, 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 so, so we have... And that yeah. is there. Where, it's there's the there's of that, and, and yet it says, I, and I'm not being Pollyanna. My God, I'm not being Pollyanna because I, I, I'm putting myself out there and I'll tell you what, I'll tell you who I'm getting smacked by. I'm getting smacked by white men. White men are pissed off about the fact that I'm speaking up. And then I'm also saying the day of the white old male dominance is done. But well, well, we have talked about this for years. Woman, it's not a new thing. Yeah. And, 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 have, and, and yet it's not, it's not new. Thing. And here's the beautiful thing, my friend. If we don't have beginner's mind, which is, I know, my black friends have said to me, Suze, we've been here before, this is not new news. I'm like, I get it. But there's also a practice called beginner's mind. Can I leave my home and travel the planet and come back to my own front door and see it again fresh for the first time? Because if, if we're understandably exhausted and I can't speak to what it must feel like to be in a state of daily hypervigilance, I don't know. I don't know what that feels like. Um, yep. but to, to refuel oh. that fire, we, we have to have the courage to begin here. I was going to ask you about this, of courage, but the, I think the comfort zone is also killing us. Yes. And I think it's so that even though some people are aware, some people are aware of yeah. things going on, but they don't have what it takes 
to change their reality or their behavior or the way to, you know, be more compassionate to others or the communication. And I, I, I struggle with that because, well, I'm out of my comfort zone and I'm so happy. Uh, <laughs> Me too. I'm happy. And oh it's my God. It's uncomfortable. I, oh my God. So uncomfortable. But I can see the benefits now of moving away from everything that I believe, everything that I was told I was going to be, everything, you know, that all the narratives, you know, and look into who I am. Or what can, but my question is, has to do with service. How can we be all of better service to make a contribution to what is going on, to make it a better place? Because I really believe everything that is going on has to do with us. It's an individual job and a collective job that we need to do. We cannot blame the external world nope. for, th for things that are, we are responsible. Yeah. But I don't see that being the case for many people. Some people don't feel part of the equation. They think it's not with them, it has nothing to do with them. And until that change, I don't think much changing. You know, I, I would share this with you in my... Um kind of my awareness of, of where, where I see possibility. Where, where do I see beyond MLK's speech standing on those steps? How ironic for a president that was the president that ended the Civil War in the United States, that we're still clearly waging. You know, it's really not done. Like, let's tell the truth. Yeah. It's been, yeah. what you said, it's been waging or raging inside instead. And what is being revealed when one starts to look at the vitriol that white supremacy has both lived with this um, um, tapped down, like you couldn't quite see it. You couldn't quite see the head of it, but, but, but it was known and clearly by different individuals experienced until we saw on national television the lynching of a black man and the shock that this is going on in the streets of america a midwestern town minneapolis minneapolis, you know, minneapolis minnesota you know i'm i'm even more uh sad about the the kid that was running for me that was so devastating i'm odd i'm odd i'm odd you know and and oh my and, god and as, as we awaken to the depravity of what lives inside the human soul, the only way we'll get past that is to recognize that instead of any of us being divided, the real truth is that generationally, individually, and collectively, Humanity has done this before. Humanity did this during the time of the Holocaust. There was just sure. a different target. And there were people who did exactly what you said, which is kind of, hey, I don't live in the Polish ghetto in Warsaw. I'm part of this other neighborhood, or those aren't my friends, or whatever it happened to be. Humanity, without specificity of the way that this is unfolded has been in genocide behavior before. Absolutely. And so we have this as a possibility within the human spirit. We also have within us the possibility to look toward who's gone before us, who's done this. I am also, by the way, pulling back out again and rereading and sharing a lot in my mindfulness teaching. Invictus, which is the poem that kept Mandiba alive for 27 years in that prison cell in Robben Island, and also the courage that the man had as Mandela, who walked into 27 years full of righteous anger and rage, being accused of murder and homicide, who walked out a tenderized soul that had the vision to bring one of his white guards to his actual presidential inauguration to become the president of South Africa. Who has gone before us? What lineage and roots live where we have not yet been before? South mm -hmm. Africa did something which was called tell the truth and talk and work on reconciliation. Desmond Tutu 
has got depth of knowledge as an elder to help us through some of these times. And the opportunity we have to actually build what the words are by Lazarus at the base of the Statue of Liberty, which is, by the way, a woman who's welcoming everyone. She's not everyone. there saying only some of you are allowed. Exactly. She's saying all come, <laughs> all, all, Ali, Ali, all come free. You know, Ali, Ali, all come free. And I also believe that's part of what's shifting, Ava. You look at the top eight countries that came out of the coronavirus experience with a more rapid response and a healthier bounce back, and they were all run by feminine leaders. Yeah. And what my, does it say? My, my dear, I think that's part of what we're looking at. And, and when we sit with the topic of how do we discuss that we have the largest incarceration rates on the civilized planet? I know. How do, we, how do we tell the truth that we are the largest armed dealer on the planet? How are we surprised that when we export violence, we get violence in our streets when we not look at separateness? And we met, we're going to have to for a while. We're, we're going to have to have safe spaces where that's going to have to happen. Of course. Um, and I get it that some white people are like, yeah, but I want to put up a Facebook post of me holding my black friend's hand. And I'm like, tone deaf right now. You know, that's tone deaf right now. I, I get what your heart intent is, but drop deeper in the intention. Are you, are, you, are you doing this because you feel shameful? Why don't you sit with feeling shameful instead of the post? Yeah, and it's not about, you know, some people think about declarations or words is what makes it. And it's not about that, unfortunately. Nope. It's not about that. That's what the yeah. modern subject is always used to do. Oh, I feel for you. No, show it to me. Not to me, me. I'm talking in general, you know? Show it to, with your actions. And, and here's one of the most brave conversations I've had. <laughs> I I've knew asked, I can have this conversation with you. <laughs> I, I've, I've asked my, my beloved black, brown, yellow. I mean, there's so many colors in there that don't even get reminded of. And I remember, I remember in... Bible class, man, growing up, that, that beautiful little song, Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Um, Ava, how do we look at one another and say, what's it like to walk around in your skin? And how do we sit with enough tender brave awareness to let you say what needs to be spoken. I can't and don't walk in your skin. I can, the round glasses you've got, the square ones I've got, we need to say here, you know what? Can you give me your glasses? Because until we build not feeling for, which is technically sympathy, by the way, when you feel for someone, there's a distance. Empathy is when you actually, in the felt sense of the body, sit with someone, allow them to share their experience, and you feel with them. It's what compassion actually means. It's why it's called the passion of the Christ, if you look at the tradition, because it's about how do I feel the horror of what that was like to be murdered on a cross? Wow. Interesting. Someone who suffered in public and no well, one. And, and I think it's important that we let aside a stereotype as the way to look filters that we used to look at other people that are not like us. And I'm yeah. talking in general, all the way. White to black, black to white. You know, we all are always judging. Always. And that's, that's I think, the seed of violence. I, I believe that the capacity to learn, again, how to pay attention on purpose, in the moment, non-judgmentally with curiosity, couldn't be a more radical act to do right now, which is to literally sit with 
and the practice I teach is sit and stay, don't run and numb. We teach our kids and our dogs to do this, but we as adults, uh, <laughs> we don't even do it, we run and numb. You know, either it's alcohol or cigarettes or shopping or wine or, you know, whatever. We run and numb. We don't want to look. Yeah. And this is where, whether it's in the topic of, um, you know, you and I first were going to have this conversation around how has COVID changed the climate of culture, for example. And mm -hmm. then I literally wrote when I started working on my responses, I went, I didn't know it would go the way it's gone so far, but I went, Ava, I can't have this conversation with you without having the conversation in the context of George Floyd's presence being here. Of course, not please have a ball. It, but because it needs to be yeah. spoken. Please have a ball. The and, question and, is where when we were at that stage. Now and, we're in and, a different one. And, and as we do that, what is being called forth in all of us is to sit with whether you're on a spiritual journey or not, I don't even care about that, is the three word question, who am I? Yeah. Who am I? And, and, and how does that answer of I am get answered? I just signed up for, I won't even say signed up for, I applied for the most badass African-American for a uh, interfaith minister who's a Zen priest her, and she's also a uh, gay. Her name is Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams. If you haven't checked out her shit, check her out. She's a badass. I will. I just applied to be allowed to participate in a sitting group. And I had to apply because they asked very direct questions at the beginning, who you are and you're about you, please identify cisgender, sexuality, Da, da 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 all of these things and please include a picture and i got to experience as a pretty white woman who looks a certain way that i'm really aware you know i like suzanne's pretty and she looks like she came from a silver spoon lifetime nobody knows that she actually knows what hunger actually is um none of that matters uh but i got the experience of having to check the boxes I got the flip the script and after I filled them all out, it said, thank you for applying. We'll get back to you with whether or not your invitation has been approved. <laughs> and I looked at it and I, I literally did it this morning before I was on the practice with you, or before the session with you today. And I thought, thought to myself, oh, so this is what it's like to have to try to fill in the boxes. Oh. This is what it's like when you fill out the application to not know if anyone will even look because of the when you apply hundreds and thousands of jobs and you are qualified and you never heard back. <laughs> and 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 or whatever and, and you start questioning, is there is there anything wrong with you? I have a with good me? education. Not good enough, whatever, all that stuff, you know, it's sad, but it is. And people don't uh pay attention to to the experiences of others, you know. They just uh, address things, I guess, with the traditional answers. Oh, well, uh, you know, things are like that. No, things are not like that. We make things, you know, we have, I, I think we have forgotten in the middle of all this our agency. I thank you. Yes, because as the, the, que the question of agency and, and, and self efficacy becomes okay, that's an interesting answer. Things are like that. Let's go a little deeper. What role do I have in things being like that? Exactly. That's the question, Maddie. How, how am I contributing to things being like that? That's the question, Maddie. And, 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 you know, we're so afraid to look. You know, I think that when I say this topic of learning the precepts of, of, of mindfulness, which is all about self-awareness, it's about having the balls to turn a mirror this way. That's what mindfulness is. Let me look. What lives in my heart? What is it that when I can't quite put my head on my pillow at night and it wakes me up at 2.30 in the morning, what's there in the dark? Because that's what's being revealed right now, by the way, is what's been living in the shadow of the human experience and the human spirit for centuries, probably for millennia. And we're finally through this man named George, whose little girl, when she stood on that 
no. opium. I she know. Said, I My know. daddy changed the world. I know. And I identified so much with her, you know. Ava, we're so lucky to be, first of all, waking up above ground right now because George is not. We're Absolutely. so lucky to be breathing today because he's not. And so many of the others, ah Ahmad and Brianna and Tamir and, and Eric and yeah. all and of you know, and we are not. very lucky to live in a country that we can see and we talk can see. about this issue yes. openly without being threatened by that. Without, and, and, and then the question Because becomes, that's the experience of my country. You, know, you cannot you question authority. No. It's in the culture because it's a political thing, you know? And, and people don't realize this, what we're doing, I think it's based on love. The love that we have for everything yeah. that's around us, or yeah. this country, the people, you know, that are here. It's just the, a call for the need to think about how we are doing things, how we are looking at each other, how we are treating ourselves and to each other. You know, do we care enough? Do we care enough about people in need? What do we do for people in need? There's a gorgeous, I've never done this before while I'm actually on a call, but or on, a, on an interview. I'm going to see if I can pull this up really quickly to try to find it. There's sure. a beautiful poem I would love to share with you that's from Thich Nhat Hanh that talks about this issue of what it is that that um, that lives in us, and why uh, why it is that it's so hard for us to look within. Let me just find it really because it's so. Oh my God, it's so yeah. powerful. In the meantime, can you please let me know if, where people can know about your work? Or Absolutely. How can people connect you. Cause... Yeah. So thank you for asking for that. You can find me on um, on Facebook under Suzanne Jewel, and also Mindful Mornings Miami. You can find me on Instagram under Mindful Mornings Miami. LinkedIn, where I do a lot of um, sharing also under Suzanne Jewell. And then my website is, is my first and last name, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-J-E-W-E-L-L.com. Um, also kind of stay tuned that I will be doing some more free offerings around training. And one of the things you and I are going to talk about offline probably is... Um, whether or not there's a way to be of service around this topic of learning how to breathe, if that might be of use. Um, this is the poem. He wrote this, by the way, in 2004, and it's Thich Nhat Hanh's poem called, Please Call Me By My True Names. Don't say that I will depart tomorrow, even today I am still arriving. Look deeply. Every second time arriving to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with still fragile wings, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that is alive. I am a mayfly metaphor metamorphosing on the surface of the river, and I am the bird that swoops down to swallow the mayfly. I am a frog swimming happily in the clear water of a pond, and I am the grass snake that silently feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. And I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. And I am the 12 year old girl, the refugee on a small boat who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I am also the pirate my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I am a member of the Politburo with plenty of power in my hands, and I am the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom all over the earth. My pain is like a river of tears, so vast it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names so I can hear all my cries and laughter at once, so I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names, so I can wake up and the door of my heart could be left open, the door of compassion. There you go. We're finished with this. I think there's nothing else to say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, my dear. <laughs> love you, bye. I love you too. Take care, ciao.